Good morning, Mercer Creek Church. It's good to see you this morning. Now, a reminder, you might have noticed as you were walking in, there is a taco truck parked at the side of the building. You will have delicious tacos prepared for you if you stay around and, and choose. We want to encourage you, come stay with us. We're going to have a great time just hanging out with one another, uh, getting to know each other. Um, there's some games outside for kids too, so make sure you stick around after the service today. We want to uh, eat and have fun together. Uh, so a couple things. Number one is our high school ministry is having an event coming up on August 17th from 7 to 9 p.m. here in the church. It's going to be food, fun, games, all that stuff. If you know college or not call it, high school students, so encourage them to come. This will be a great time just to enjoy summer and to engage one another. So that, that event's coming up here. And I also want to pray for our Mexico mission trip. They're going to Door of Faith, and um, I thought it would be very appropriate for us just to honor their um, trip down there and to be able to celebrate that and to be able to pray over them. So I'd like to ask you to actually help me participate in this. Would you stand up with me right now? Um, I love it when people choose to go away and experience God in different cultures. This is a huge opportunity, and I'd like to pray over the team. So will you pray with me? Lord God, I'm so grateful that we have a team going to uh, Door of Faith. And I, I know one of the things they're doing this week is giving all the um, kitchen staff the week off so they can cook for them. Lord, will that go flawlessly? Will they have just great food for everybody? Will everything go as planned? And Lord, where the hiccups are, will you just provide supernaturally? But as they serve and engage the orphans, as they um, get into the community and do what, what the ministry down there needs, would you bless them all mightily? And may they see again that Jesus is the center of everything everything, and he matters not only in our culture, but in Door of Faith as well. And Lord, may their trip just be a huge blessing, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's stay standing and let's worship together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise
Thank you. 
accident that you brought us all into this room today to worship you and to receive this word. So, Lord, I just pray that you would prepare us uh, to hear what you have to say today, Lord, and that we would grow closer to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may feel free to be seated. As we continue our time of worship today, we want to take a moment uh, to give our tithes and our offerings back to the Lord. And as we do that today, I want to challenge you to, to maybe think about it a little differently. I know when I give my monthly tithe, I go online and kind of go through the motions of almost like how I pay a bill. But today I want to remind you what we do in our giving, it's sacred. It's an act of worship. It's an act of obedience. So instead, I challenge you, whether it's today or the next time you give, take a moment to pray. And I want to encourage you to pray a couple of different things as you talk to God. First, take some time to, to worship, to thank God for how he has provided for you. To, 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 to be reminded as you worship that everything you have is a gift from God, that he is your provider, and that as you give, you are giving in obedience and giving as an act of worship. So take some time to pray. And, and as you pray, maybe even take that bold step of faith and say, God, what is it you are calling me to give today? And just be open to his leading and leadership. Maybe he pushes you to give differently than you normally would. Now, there are three different ways that you can give today. Uh, as you leave, if you're in the room with us, you can give in the offering boxes at the exits as you leave. Uh, you can also give electronically uh, by using our mobile app or going online to our website at mercercreek.org slash give. Well, in just a moment, we're going to hear our message today. Uh, and to prepare, I want to invite you to get out your Bible, maybe open your Bible app or a journal as we prepare to hear from God's word. I wanna have a quick family moment before we jump into the message. It is, <laughs> I'm telling no one anything new. This last season of our world has been a little bit hectic. It's been crazy. Um, I mean, look at our economy now. Things are upside down. Um, sometimes relationships are upside down. We've seen all sorts of changes. Even here at this church, we've seen changes. We've seen people go, we've seen people come, we've seen people online. All these things have happened. And what we wanted to do today is just inform you about something that's coming because here's what we want. Um, we know that the past is not gonna be our future. And so we wanted to have the healthiest future as possible. So next month, we're gonna be starting something that we're gonna do for, uh, we'll have, it'll be open for the month, but essentially, it's something called the peak assessment. Um, I actually did a webinar on this a while back, it's with our denomination. Um, they have done this incredible work of going back and reviewing the early church and looking at the, the greatest content and, and kind of biblical thrust of the early church and saying, hey, are our churches matching that? Are we on the right track? And so what I'm, all I'm gonna ask of you is that you would participate in the assessment, that you would fill it out, that you would give your perspective, that you would give your point of view. Really, everybody's opinion matters. And so we'll do this assessment and then we'll take a few months to be able to process the information and it will help us figure out what are the healthy next steps for us as a church to move forward. So church, I just wanna encourage you, that's coming. You'll hear lots more about it in the month of September, but I wanted you to know it was coming because it matters so much that we've moved towards health in these weird and uncertain times, amen? Let me start now with prayer. Lord God, thank you that you care about Mercer Creek Church. Thank you, Lord, for both our campuses. Thank you for what you have done here and what you are doing here. Lord, thank you for the future you're going to write for us, even though at this point we don't know what it is. God, you are good and kind and generous, and we need you. So Lord, please, 
let us follow your promptings. We ask this all in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen. amen. This summer we have been going through the book of Matthew. Uh, one of our the time of worship today. I am so tired of Dan interrupting me. That's it. Um, he's on vacation and he still interrupted me. This, uh, this church is pretty wild. Like, say, again, we're going to get healthy, Dan. All right. Um, no. We've been going through the book of Matthew. If you have a Bible, pull it out. If you have an app, pull it out. We're in Matthew chapter 11. Now, for the last month, we've been going through Matthew chapter 10. Matthew 10 is basically Jesus calls the disciples, and then he warns the disciples that they're going to be persecuted, and then he encourages the disciples, and then he says to them, hey, guys, by the way, you need to know your family, your spouse, your kids, your parents, they're not more important than me. I am what's most important in your life if you're going to follow me, and if you're not willing to put me first, you are are not worthy of me. Huge statement, okay? Now here we are in, in Matthew chapter 11. I gotta say this about Matthew 11. I was thinking about this. Nobody I know sits there and quotes to me Matthew chapter 11. It's, not, it's, it's one of those passages that's a little bit more obscure. And again, it's not bad content. It's just there's so much contextual stuff going on here. We'll walk through it. I'll try to explain it to you so that we, it makes sense to us. But I think we can pull some nuggets from this. So as much as this is a different sort of text, let's try to engage it and see if we can't learn something, all right? Matthew chapter 11, verse 1. When Jesus had finished inter- instructing his disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Right? He gives them instructions, he tells them what to do, and then he shows them how to do it. That is the classic teacher move, isn't it? Now, When John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? Let me catch you up on this part of the story. John is John the Baptist. John the Baptist is kind of the crazy dude who's out in the wilderness saying repent for, you know, the kingdom of God is at hand. Follow God, follow God, repent, repent, repent. Although one time, one of, the, um, one of the kind of officials of the place, it was Herod's brother, had come to John and said, hey, you know what, he, basically he said, Herod, Herod's brother said, hey, is you know, my marriage okay? And John's like, no, that's illegal, you shouldn't do that. And of course, then he was thrown into prison because of this. So John is looking at life right now and going, oh, I wonder, is this imprisonment the end of my life? And so he asks a question, he's trying to figure it out. Is Jesus the one? Is, is he the guy who, you know, again, it's his cousin, but it's like, is he really the one? Is he the chosen one? Is he the Messiah? Are you him? And this is what Jesus told John through his disciples. He's, Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Leopards are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Jesus is saying the proof of who I am is what I do. Jesus, like his disciples whom he sent, has a ministry of healing, making blind people see without surgery, modern technology, and optometry is otherworldly. Helping people to walk who are lame still is an unbelievable task. Those who are lepers, who have uncurable conditions with their skin, Jesus is not only not afraid to touch them, but he can heal them. That's both amazing and countercultural. And imagine being cut off from the world of people, because that's what it is when you're deaf, you're cut off from people. And then this prophet, this rabbi comes and enables you to hear and comprehend. Can you imagine? But more than all that, he can do what no one else can do. He can raise people from the dead without defibrillators and without regard to time, meaning we've seen him raise people from the dead not because they're on an operating table and they get shocked back to life, but hours or days after they die, Jesus is able to bring them back. This is unbelievable, otherworldly, truly miraculous. But it's not just healing. Jesus says, hey, by the way, I'm also here to proclaim, to preach. And by the way, and notice who he says he's preaching to, to the poor, which basically is I'm preaching to everybody. 
the part of culture that we ignore the most, the poor people. No, 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 I'm going to engage them. I'm here to preach to them and everyone else. Essentially, Jesus says that he's here to proclaim or to preach the good news, which we have a religious word for it, the gospel. The news that's better than any other news, that he is the solution to the problems of the world, that through him is access to life eternal. God's grace is offered and the kindness of God is extended not because of what we have done, but because of his mercy. And then Jesus tags on this little phrase, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Hmm. Not offended by me. I had a friend who used to work in the state legislature and occasionally when they would open up their sessions of legislation, they would have a pastor come and pray over it. But there was one rule that was given to these pastors when they came to pray. You may pray, but do not use the name of Jesus. Why? Because that name still offends people today. Jesus separates people. His ideas, his identity, his calling, his personhood, his truths are not are not what all people want. And he's right, we are blessed when we find him. So in a rabbinical sort of way, Jesus is saying, hey John, yeah, I'm the one. I am that one. Now that that message is given to John's disciples, they apparently go away. And what's interesting though, is that at this point in the text, Jesus goes on a pretty long section where he affirms who John is. Because there's a little bit of history where these two, again, their thinking patterns might not have totally matched up in what he's trying to tell everybody. No, no, no. I love John. Verse 7. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A, A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in the king's houses. What did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and, he, and more than a prophet. Three times he asks a question. This is a rabbinical teaching technique. He's trying to get people to think. He's trying to capture his, his crowd's attention. He goes, guys, pay attention. I'm asking this three times so that you kind of wake up to the bigger question. Are you going out to see a reed? Reeds would grow about 15 feet high. Are they swaying back and forth? And his point is, no, no, no. John never swayed back and forth. He was always consistent. His message was always the same. He always said, repent, turn around, surrender to God. There is only one way to God. It is through repentance. So he's not like a reed swaying back and forth. He asked the second time, what did you go out to see? Some guy in fancy clothes? Have you ever heard the story of John the Baptist? If you know anything about him, this guy wore, think about this. Camel hair clothing. I don't, I don't know if that is comfortable. It doesn't sound nice. And then a leather belt. Like this guy is not a guy who's wearing fancy clothing. The fancy clothing bit, this is, all, this is all alluding to the fact, is John royalty? Is he a king and has some, some great power that you go out to see him? No, 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 he's none of those things. He's just the opposite. So he asks one more time, what did you see? Again, he's, Jesus is piquing his listeners' interest. He's trying to get them to pay attention. And finally, he answers his rhetorical question. You saw a prophet. That's what John is. John is a prophet. But the title of prophet is not enough for John. Jesus is proclaiming he's actually even more. So if any of the crowd were wondering whether or not Jesus was upset with John or against John because of the earlier question, what they just witnessed was a master class in support but he's not done yet. Verse 10. This is he of whom it is written, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. When Jesus quoted this, he's actually quoting a passage from the Old Testament, which was a messianic prophecy. Again, a messianic prophecy is a prophecy of the future one to come. And in Malachi chapter 3, we read, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Jesus is quoting this Old Testament prophecy, and he's telling the crowd that John is the fulfillment of this prophecy in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Notice how Jesus gives value to him. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has risen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of 
heaven is greater than he. Okay, what does this mean? At first glance, this is confusing. First, we see Jesus proclaim that, that John is pretty much the best of the best. He's, he's the number one. He's a superior role to everyone else. He's the top prophet. In fact, his role creates all sorts of honor. Why? John's role is greatest because of who he introduced. Okay? That's why he's the greatest prophet, because he is the one who introduced Jesus to the world. But then Jesus notes that the least in the kingdom is greater than this. What does that mean? Think about this for a second. You and I are greater than John the Baptist. Hmm. Why? We're greater because we know the rest of the story. See, John was questioning at this point, hey, is Jesus the one? John had a curiosity. John is like related to Jesus. He baptized Jesus. He's been around Jesus. He lived, you know, in the same region as Jesus, and yet he still wasn't sure. But we know the rest of the story. Today, as believers, we have a greater role than the greatest prophet because we know the whole story. Doesn't that feel like Jesus is entrusting us with something special? Well, at this point in the text, Jesus also notes the craziness of the living conditions where they are at this point. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent has taken it by force. And the truth is, that's true in their area of the world. For for that Jewish culture, which is considered a sect within this greater Roman empire, yeah, they've known violence. It's been a rough go. It would be really awful to live in an occupied land. We know nothing of that. I'm sure this statement about violence would ring true, especially with John and his disciples, because there's John sitting in prison right now. He knows the effects of what violence happened, and he will know even worse pretty soon. But then Jesus continues, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, this is an obscure reference here. But again, same book we go back to, the book of Malachi, chapter 4. We read another prophecy that says this. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Again, this too is a future prophecy. Let me explain its meaning The name used here, Elijah, is a reference to the Old Testament Elijah, who is the great prophet of old. And what this, this, basically this verse is symbolizing is someday there will be another great prophet like Elijah. Elijah is a symbol, okay? And this prophet will come to herald the Messiah. Jesus is saying this, listen up. If you can actually hear, pay attention. John is Elijah, and he's preparing the way for Jesus. Again, do you see how affirming Jesus is of John? This this section of the Bible really got me thinking about reputation. I want you to ponder this for a second. What's your reputation? How do others think about you? Because remember, reputation is not what you think about you. (laughs) It's what other people think about you. If Jesus was here right now, what would Jesus say about you? Jesus had nothing but kindness and appreciation for John. He clearly admired the man and his message. And my inward dialogue started kind of pinging at this point. Would Jesus celebrate me as well? I, I know we're all different with different roles to play, but, but are we being faithful? Church, I want to challenge you. Have that conversation with God. It might lead to a wonderful restart. It m- might actually lead to corrective behavior. It, it, it might be very encouraging, too. Because here's what I know about each and every person in this room. Jesus loves you. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. He adores you. 
He loves you. You're his kid. He wants you. He wants you to follow him. He's done everything for you. God has this abundant grace that is so strong and beautiful, and he wants you to experience. Church, you are deeply, deeply loved by the author of the universe. Never forget that. At this point, Jesus shocks the crowd, though, by identifying their condition, and I think this maybe be a wake-up call for us too. But what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting at the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. (laughs) I read this, I go, what? Like context, context, what is this trying to say? Essentially what Jesus is doing is comparing and contrasting Jesus and John. In other parts of the Gospels, we see crowds and and disciples of both these teachers questioning each other. And Jesus is trying to put a stop to that. So he uses illustrations about children to show how their adults are acting like children. Imagine that. Have you ever seen an adult act like a child? No, never. Well, one example says, hey, we played the flute, but you didn't dance. The idea is that one group of children offered an opportunity and the others didn't respond. Why would Jesus be making this comparison? Again, I believe it's about John and Jesus. John prepared the way, but many refused Jesus because they didn't want to hear John's message. Second example is some kids sang a sad song, but the others didn't mourn. They didn't join into the condition offered. Again, John the Baptist had a ministry of repentance, but many refused to repent because they didn't want to. And again, without repentance, we don't get Jesus. But then Jesus goes a step deeper with another Jesus-John comparison. Verse 18, for John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he is a demon. And the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Okay, I gotta explain this one. John was an aesthetic. He, he, he was an Essene, which is a, a very um, interesting Jewish sect which would live out in the desert, and basically their whole objective was to have as little as possible. These guys lived with very little. They ate very little. Their whole objective was, I don't need to focus on the material stuff. I need to focus solely on God himself. And to some religious people today, the they looked at that and thought, God, this guy's a wacko. What did they use? They said, oh, he has a demon. Yeah, that's easier. He doesn't eat enough. He's he's crazy. He doesn't like tacos. This man, no, no good. Then the son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Again, then the opposite happened. See, Jesus just came, and he acted normal. He, he ate what normal people ate. And because it wasn't John's sex, and it wasn't the Pharisees, they were all like, oh, look at you. You eat on the Sabbath, and you do all these things, and blah, 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 blah. Again, he couldn't win either, and they said, and so they called him a drunkard, drunkard and, and a glutton, which if you were a, a, a prophet and you had those titles, you were to be killed, because that's not allowed for prophets. And then on top of this, it seemed like Jesus was able to befriend everyone, and there was undesirable people that religious people didn't like to befriend, so then, you know, and Jesus knew how to throw a party, so it's like, ooh, I don't think, you know, Jesus is not a good guy. I I do not doubt that these different accusations were untrue. I I believe these were actually true, true illustrations, and I'm confident that Jesus and John probably heard this stuff. But I want you to notice the last little sentence that was tucked into verse 19. It's brief, it's simple, but it's profound. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. John was accused of being a false prophet and was imprisoned for speaking the truth. Jesus was dismissed because of his supposedly outrageous claims and was ultimately crucified. John was considered the greatest prophet who ever lived. Jesus is the chosen one, the holy one of God. He is the deliverer of sin, shame, and abandonment. John had a brilliant ministry. Jesus is the author of the universe, yet both of them were ultimately rejected. What Jesus knew was this. Both were justified by what they did. They served They loved, and ultimately they did what God asked them to do, but that wasn't enough for the religious people of their day. John, who lived the ascetic life, who had no material wealth, who was a burden to no one, was unsatisfactory to the religious. They found fault in him and called him a devil because no one in their 
right mind would live in such an eclectic lifestyle. Jesus, the Son of God, lived as other men lived. He did not practice the way of John's sect. He ate food like the normal culture did, but were they satisfied with him? No, he befriended the wrong people and apparently knew how to throw a good party. What is Jesus' point? Wisdom is justified by action, by what you do. What you do actually tells the real story. But wow, we get caught up in the religious junk, don't we? We dismiss people because they behave differently. We condemn people because they don't agree with us. We reject because they do it a different way. We demean because we believe our way is better. We harbor anger towards those who value different things. We verbally assault, yet we give ourselves a pass on our own sin. It's kind of like that thing you've heard before. Uh, heads I win, tails you lose. And when we play that game with our faith, it is ultimately destructive. There is not a person in this room that thinks, oh, you know what, I would disagree with Jesus. No, I mean, it's so obvious, Jesus is so obvious. Nobody here would probably even disagree with John. We all think, oh, no, no, I would have, I, 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 know, I know the truth, I'm good. But, but like Jesus said, we are greater than John because we know the whole story. Here's the truth you need to think about. What if you didn't know the story? What if you didn't know the whole story? You'd be just like those people that Jesus was talking about because that's normal human behavior. Church, as we're closing today, I want that last sentence to sink in. Wisdom is justified by her deeds. God is wisdom. And when we see him, we see the truth. And when we see Christ's deeds, it paves the way to experience him. But church, if we reject Jesus' deeds, if we ignore them and pretend they have no meaning, we can't see what Jesus offers us. The demonstration of God's capacity through miracles are not fairy tale or make believe. They're veiled signs. And yes, all signs can do is promote belief. And believe me, they do. Sometimes it's the miracles of life that people go, oh, I get it now. But I've noticed through the years, miracles never compel belief. They really don't. Our culture is too uncomfortable with the unknowable, and my gut tells me that most cultures are that way. But let's be honest. Your obligation is not to manage someone else's story. Your responsibility is you. And so I want to give you a Jesus-sized encouragement today. Chase wisdom. Pursue wisdom. Hunt for truth. In fact, if I could summarize everything that we know into one glorious word, it would be the word grace. That's what we need to go after. Do whatever it takes to give and receive grace. We are greater than John the Baptist. We're greater than the greatest prophet who ever lived. Why? Because we know about the cross and we know about the resurrection. We know that he offers us the gift of eternal life to all who believe. We know that he is preparing a place for us in his father's house. We are greater than John because we know the whole story. And what makes Christianity so good in the first century is what makes it great in the 21st. Grace. What is the cost of this incredible gift that makes us citizens of the kingdom of heaven? Jesus' life for all creation. That's grace. Grace is God's unmerited favor. Grace is getting what we do not deserve. Grace is essentially eternity without strings attached. Grace is the voice beckoning us to change, and grace is the power to make those changes. Well-known author Max Lucado said it so well from a different story in the Bible. He said, mercy is the prodigal son getting a second chance. Grace is giving him a feast. Church, if you do not have grace, do whatever it takes to find it. 
It is the gift of Jesus that sets everything apart. And if you want to know more about it, then what you need to do is pursue wisdom and pursue it with all your strength and all your might because grace is everything. And if you need help with that, come and talk to me. I'd I'd love to share more. When you've received grace, my encouragement to you is do whatever it takes to keep grace in your heart and soul because grace matters not only for you, but for our culture who desperately needs grace givers to step into the gap where our world is hurting so much. Mercer Creek, remember this. You can't give grace away until you recognize how desperately you need it. Remember, you are greater than the greatest prophet who ever lived. You know grace you know the cross, you know the resurrection. And today, we want to celebrate that knowledge in our most sacred way. If you would right now, I want to encourage you, would you pull out those cups um, that we have, those little communion cups? And I want to ask this, if anybody needs one, will you just raise a hand? I know Dave Ruminata's around here somewhere. He will come and bring it to you. Dave, where did you go? I just, he just left. Oh, there he is. Dave, hands are up right here. Keep the hands nice and high. Dave is coming. Just keep your hands up, and he'll, he'll come. One of these guys will come and find you. Um, and what I want you to do is open up the lids on that. It's annoying. It's plastic. It's loud. Open both lids, first the plastic one, then the metal one. Open them both up. I don't want to hear plastic later. Uh, this, right now, we have no grace about plastic. So open them up. Just get those all open, and then we're gonna, we're gonna do Holy Communion together as a church. Let me read this passage where Jesus talks about what we're to do in Holy Communion. Because really, when you think about this, this is the, one of the pinnacles of our faith experience is to remember Jesus. Listen to these words. This is Paul talking, and he's, then Jesus does it all. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, here's Jesus' words, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Church, I want to encourage you to take your moment right now with the Lord and do the one thing he asked. Remember him. But let's remember his grace. Let's remember that he has given us the knowledge to be greater than the greatest prophet. Let's remember that God did everything so that we can have right relationship with our Father in heaven. And it's not based on us. It's based solely on the grace that he gives. And then after your moment of reflection, in your own timing, take the elements and celebrate the God who has given you so much.
God, we thank you so much for the scripture that reminds us that we can cast all of our anxieties on you because you care for us. And not only do you care for us, but you give us grace that is new every single morning, God. And we know that you are bigger and greater than any fear, any anxiety, any worry that we will ever experience. So God, I pray that as we sing this last song today, that we would truly just let go, that we would give all of our burdens to you, Lord, that you would free us. that we get to celebrate you and that we get to come together and worship in freedom. 
Jesus, I just pray that you would remind every soul here about your grace and about your love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, Mercy Creek, thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed the service today, you can do one of the big three button pushes. That is, subscribe to our channel. You can like us and you could share this video with your friends or family. If you're in a small group or micro church, you can engage discussion with one of these questions. First of all, what word or phrase stood out to me from the message? Second, what impacted me? And then third, what are my next steps moving forward? If you want to go deeper in your discussion, the link to small group questions is below. And once again, thanks for joining us.